Hello, I'm Philippa McDonald. Welcome and thank you for joining Compass, guiding action on elder abuse for this webinar, grandparent alienation, why it happens and what you can do. I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. I pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Let me introduce you to Compass. It's a national website connecting people to services and information tackling elder abuse in all its forms. Compass is created by Elder Abuse Action Australia with funding from the Australian Government's Attorney General's Department. Compass is committed to ensuring equitable and inclusive responses to end elder abuse for everyone affected, including people with diverse characteristics and life experiences. If you or someone you know needs help tackling elder abuse, go to www.compass.info. Now it's time to hear from Colleen Hanlon. Now she's from Grandparents for Grandchildren. Colleen is a senior carer advocate for grandparents uh, in Adelaide. Thank you, Colleen. Grandparents for Grandchildren in South Australia was established in 2001 by Denise and John Langton because they um, were asked to raise their grandchild and they found that there were no supports in South Australia for them. We have two sides of the organisation. We have one that is raising of the grandchildren and the other side that we found the need for was alienation. So grandparents are alienated from their grandchildren and this causes a lot of stress. And that is my focus, is the alienated grandparents. We have about 300 um, alienated clients on our database and the alienation is growing. Grandparents are alienated for several reasons. Uh, one is circumstantial reasons where the uh, families have moved into state or into another country town or um, overseas and then the, uh, so that is a geographical alienation. The other side of it is the um, deliberate action of uh, parents to um, cut off their, their own parents from their grandchildren. And this is um, because of marriage breakdowns, it could be because of drug and mental health issues, it could be because of jealousy, um, of a, a parent being jealous of a relationship that the grandchildren have with their grandparents. Um, and it comes in very, uh, many varied um, forms. And uh, that really is the, um, the sort of, I suppose, the majority of our cases. Now, we'll hear more from Colleen during this web webinar for her very important perspective. Now, let me introduce our panel. Sue Field is an adjunct associate professor at Charles Sturt University, a director of the Australian Centre for Elder Law Proprietary Limited, and a distinguished fellow at the Canadian Centre for Elder Law. Sue was until recently co-editor of the Elder Law Review. Sue has taught elder law for many years, published widely, and presented at many international and national events. Sue is currently enrolled in a PhD, developing an innovative model for the teaching of elder law. She joins us from Orange in the central west of New South Wales. Thanks, Sue. Gabrielle Parslow. So <laughs> Welcome. Gabrielle Parslow has degrees in psychology and education, conflict resolution, mediation, and postgraduate qualifications in family dispute uh, resolution and community sector management. Gabrielle has worked in mediation and family dispute resolution since 2004 and more recently, a practitioner in elder mediation with Relationships Queensland. Gabrielle is a nationally accredited mediator and a registered family dispute resolution practitioner with the Attorney General's Department.
Gabrielle is passionate about the rights of older Australians and how those rights are negatively impacted by grandparent alienation as a form of elder abuse. Gabrielle joins us from Maroochydore. Hi, Gabrielle. Hello. Now we're going to Melbourne. Adonis Antonius Maglis is a community engagement capacity building officer at Pronia, who is passionate about community development and supporting healthy, connected and inclusive communities. He facilitates the access and social inclusion of older people and people with a disability from culturally and linguistically diverse culled backgrounds into social, recreational and civic life in a number of areas across Melbourne. With strong experience in cull-based community development programs, health promotion, education training and similar related environments, Adonis Antonius helps communities plan, collaborate and connect with a variety of programs, services and supports. So welcome Adonis Antonius from Melbourne. Thank you, nice to be here. Thank you. Now let's set the scene. How do you each define grandparent alienation? If I could ask you briefly to give a definition, Sue Field. Well, put it in the most simplest terms, it's when grandparents are alienated from their grandchildren and it's not of their own doing. So uh, for whatever reason, and Colleen gave wonderful um, examples, um, for whatever reason, um, the grandparents are denied access in some form or another to their grandchildren. Thank you. And Gabrielle, if I could bring you in. Yeah, thanks. So just adding on to what Sue has said there, I think um, it is definitely about uh, the contact or the relationship with the grant between the grandparents and the grandchildren um, being intentionally sabotaged, <laughs> where there is um, withdrawal of the children from the grandparents. But if you think about it in terms of its actions or intentions from other people that impact the ability of the grandparent and the grandchildren to have an established relationship, develop the relationship and maintain it. So, to, and that can take many forms as we'll probably talk about today, but that's my take on adding on to what Sue said there. And uh, Adonis Antonius, what would you say in terms of how you define it? I think the two definitions we uh, covered now cover it very well. Um, yes, I'm not sure if I can add anything else to that. Well, we're going to call upon you in a little while. Give us examples of the types of alienation grandparents can experience, how it can play out. Gabrielle, you're in Queensland. This isn't something yeah. that you're just seeing in Brisbane or the city either, is it? What are you seeing in regional Queensland? So I guess um, what I'm seeing, I mean, obviously I work in the metropolitan area in the southeast of Queensland. However, I've had some interesting cases come up which are based in regional areas. One of those in particular is um, around succession planning of a third generation farming family uh, with an example being that the daughter in the family is actually using or threatening grandparent alienation unless she gets her way in terms of what that succession planning will look like and her involvement. So, so that's, um, you know, one type of issue that arises in a regional community. But, of course, we've got the other issues as well, which is that, um, as Colleen referred to in that opening introduction, which is the general withdrawal of contact, um, it, I mean, there's just so many different ways that this alienation plays out um, the different types yeah, that we come across as well. So it, we also need to add in, because this is about alienation, and if we think of it in the context of general parental alienation, there's also that element of denigration that occurs. So it can be that the parents denigrate the grandparents in front of the children or to the grandchildren. Um, so that's also an issue that I see coming up often. Well, and, and Adonis Antonius, how about suburban Melbourne and in a migrant community renowned for having close family connections? Yes, what we see the last few years, particularly um, working with um, 
working with a Greek community, with older people and grandparents within the Greek uh, community context. Um, the community is massively aging disproportionately to the rest of the population because a uh, majority of post-war migrants arrived at the same time at a very similar age. So we see that those, those issues are escalating now. Um, and, and, and I guess the most common scenario is when adult children separate and very often one of them will return home. Usually the son will return to live at home with the mother, the elderly mother, uh, and, and very often um, the son cannot access his children, is not allowed to, to access his children, and, and as a result, also the grandparents cannot uh, see their children. So it's sort of a bit um, like an indirect punishment, you know, because one of the parents are banned for whatever situation, then that side of the family is also directly affected by that. That's one of the most common examples. It's really heartbreaking. And look, is it common? Is it on the rise? Uh, are you seeing this, Adonis Antonius? I mean, you've got this particular cohort of, of grandparents and uh, we've got high divorce rates, but what are the other factors at play? And do you think it's increasing? I think it's increasing, um, firstly, because, as I said, our community has peaked in terms of the, 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 the aging process. Um, also, you know, the, the, the second generation um, who are middle aged now, they, they, there's a lot of issues there in uh, marital conflict, loss of work, mental health issues. COVID has definitely exacerbated this. Um, and I think... Yes, as people age, um, we need to keep in mind that today we live approximately 10 years more than, you know, 50, 60 years ago with medication management, etc. So we've got people who are older and older and older, but we also have people who um, separate, have family con conflict, they move back home like boomerang children uh, and their children. So I think... Um, there is an increase. Of course, I don't have particular numbers. And I don't think that, you know, that particular community will have more sort of incidents. I think this happens across across the border. But from my experience with the Greek community, we know that um, this is increasing um, as, the, uh, as people live longer. And as time goes by, uh, we see more and more of those issues. Definitely. Yeah. Well, Sue Field, can I bring you in? Um, what are you using? What are you studying in terms of how common it is, whether it's on the rise and whether there are particular trends that you're seeing? Most of my, thanks, Philippa. Most of my experience has been with the grandparents raising um, grandkids. And then I had this uh, hypothesis probably a decade ago now that there was a new form of elder abuse. And that was, um, and Adonis has touched on it, um, the adult children who've been overseas, they come back just for a couple of weeks, you know, to live at home just so they get on their feet. They might come back on their own with a baby, with a partner, with a partner and a baby. Baby. and two years later they're still there and all they've done is lift their knives and forks um, and so then eventually they shift out the grandparents are then expected to look after the grandkids it's great if they want to and they can but I think what um, I'm starting to see now and I hate owning up to this but I don't think there are any advantages to getting older and each year it seems there are less but what you do have an advantage of is hearing lots of stories and so all of a sudden when I've told people about this seminar this webinar um, people are starting to tell me their stories about, well, you know, um, it's my son and um, you know, his wife. And, and, and I said, what are you doing for Christmas? And they said, oh, just having a family Christmas, just a quiet one. But it meant the other in-laws, <laughs> not them. So there's situations where it seems to me one set of grandparents, for whatever reason, um, seem to get all the benefits and the other set miss out altogether. 
Are we turning talking maternal paternal um in yes, some yes, cases sorry. and i realize oh, well, we are a more... or it may be same sex yes yes yes, yes. so um and then I think, and stop me if I'm preempting any questions, I think um, you always have to be mindful as the grandparent what steps you take. Yes, I am preempting um, <laughs> because you don't want to alienate your own child. Of course. And, and so, Gabrielle, I'd like to uh, bring you in. Um, and I know Sue talks about this, uh, but it's an increasingly popular term but not so popular if you're on the pointy end, but inheritance <laughs> impatience. Yes, that chestnut. Um, look, yes, that certainly is, I guess, an area where grandparent alienation comes in. So what we see, and, you know, I wear two hats because I do elder abuse, um, sorry, I work in the elder abuse space, but I also work in the family dispute resolution space as well. So in either case, we do actually see where we've got um, adult children who um, are, um, for whatever reason, sensing that they have this entitlement to the family home. So I've had comments made by adult children, so the parents of the grandchildren, saying, um, you know what, I think it's if you really loved your grandchildren, you would allow us to have the family home and you should actually move into a granny flat perhaps in the back of the house or maybe some other facility um, would be good for you as well. If you loved your grandchildren, you would do this. So we have this um, sense of entitlement or they're just impatient for their inheritance. But we also see that um, they're actually, I guess, using control or that emotional blackmail, um, knowing that they really, grandparents are invested in their grandchildren and those relationships. And so that's a side of parents that I see often. And the grandparents are really at a loss. And Sue said, you know, they don't want to lose the relationship or jeopardise further the relationship that they have with their own children in order to address the grandchild alienation. So they're really stuck. Um, it's really challenging for them. Now, I'm going to flip it for a moment, Gabrielle. Yep. Uh, I mean, often the causes of grandparent alienation are inexplicable. Mm. And this is a difficult conversation, and we'll tread carefully here, but you're saying sometimes grandparents unintentionally contribute mm. to the situation. Walk us through. Okay. So, as you said, there's quite a few drivers, if you like, to um, consider in terms of grandparent alienation. But... Um, and that could be things like mental health concerns, substance misuse. There's a whole range of issues that um, contribute to grandparent alienation. And I've, what were we talking about? Sorry, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> That's how grandparents can unwittingly oh, yes. contribute. Uh, yeah. You know, like, is it yes, like... Yes, yes. So thinking back Lollies, to, is it uh, religion, um, is it... it can be cultural um, differences, if you like. It can be those religious beliefs. It can be the fact that you're the grandma. You want to be the one that is the that gives the everything at all times. So, yeah, we'll slot the lollies in the bag as the kid's going off to school or we'll feed them pizza every night. So it's about, um, I guess, and these are sort of things that contribute to this um, misunderstanding if you like so there's assumptions that are made sometimes in grandparent and um, parent in the relationship between grandparents and parents of the children about what's the expectation how what is my role as a grandparent so they make an assumption that I'm just going to do all the things I want to do with this grandchild and then it can actually compound particularly I'm seeing in the daughter-in-law or the son-in-law relationship um, that definitely comes through and they'll say look you know it's not I just don't want my children going there anymore because it's just too hard we get them home and they're wired they're not listening to how we want to discipline or feed our children so sometimes grandparents with the best of intentions can have um, a contribution contribution to what's going on in terms of the breakdown in that relationship um, those things can be resolved as long as we're talking with through them but we won't go down to resolutions at this point we'll, well look, I think I think we are at half time um, in terms of the panel discussion because we want to bring in as many questions through the chat box as possible and this might be a good time 
to turn the corner, to ask people to have uh, pen and paper handy at the ready uh, and to bring back uh, Colleen, um, uh, Colleen Hanlon, a senior carer for grandparents in Adelaide. We make a difference by offering support and advocacy for our grandparents, especially for the alienated ones who are feeling lost, sad, emotional, um, and they feel um, there is a sense of shame as well because this has happened in their family. So they don't know where to go to or what's the, what's the best way to get access to these grandchildren. So therefore, we are able to offer them the support and advocacy we have a special support group that only they come along to. And so they can talk to other grandparents who are experiencing this. And in the federal system, grandchildren have a right to see and have a relationship with their grandparents. We need that to be on both sides of it. Grandparents need to have a right to have a relationship with their grandchildren. We always encourage our grandparents, our alienated ones, to sort of keep a... Uh, a diary, uh, keep a, a treasure box of cards, uh, not so much presents, but cards, postcards, stories of their life. And um, if they travel, to have postcards of where they've traveled to, and to have photos of different things in their lives, like birthdays, wedding anniversaries, and so forth. So that when the grandchildren come back to them, and we never ever give up hope, when the grandchildren come back to them, then they have a history of their grandparents, and they have a history of the love that their grandparents have got for them. Um, there are other ways that grandparents can. Um, so a lot of them have gone through the court process to, um, to obtain access to them. So that needs to be documented within their um, history so that the children know that these grandparents never, ever, ever gave up um, their grandchildren, never gave up hope to have them reunified with them. So never, ever give up hope. Um, Colleen Hanlon has a strong message of some strategies when things can feel very dire and a message that when you're reunif you reunified with them. Thank you, Colleen. Okay, now uh, we must talk about solutions and remedies and I'm getting through the chat box that this is what you want to hear. Uh, divorce, uh, do grandparents have rights and what can they do, Sue Field? Sue? Under the Family Law Act, um, oh, sorry, I'm... Sue Field, yeah. I'm just can gonna ask that me? question. Yes, I can hear you. And yep. I'm just wondering, do grandparents have rights in divorce? <laughs> and, um, and what can they do? Grandpa under the Family Law Act, grandparents are specifically mentioned, um, but you must remember the Family Law Act, when it comes to children, look at what is in the best interests of the child. And it may be, you know, taking into consideration maybe the relationship that they have with uh people who are meaningful in their lives and grandparents certainly fit in to that category. So we would say grandparents have standing uh, within the um, family law courts. But um, if you're going down that track, then you have to have very deep pockets. You have to have stamina. It's anyway, you need to have mediation before you even get to, get to the court stage. But yeah. the point is with any issue to do with the courts, tribunals, whatever it is, um, I hope some of the audience are old enough to know what a whodunit is, you know, a murder mystery. But reading a murder mystery, you get to the last page and you say, I didn't see that coming. Going to court is exactly the same. You know, everyone who goes to court thinks they're going to win, but that, that doesn't happen. So, yes, under the law, the Family Law Act, grandparents have standing. They can certainly make an application for your know, parenting orders. 
Um, and when we've talked about grandparents raising grandchildren, sometimes they have no option but to apply for a parenting order. However, having said that, when it comes to children, the adult children, um, denying access or a meaningful relationship with the grandchildren, I, I would hesitate to say about going to court as your first option. Well, this is a good time to bring Gabrielle in. Um, yeah. what, what do you want for their relationship? <laughs> Sue, and I, <laughs> Sue and I are on the same page here. Um, so uh, court, as everything Sue has said, court's costly. Um, the, it may be that it causes more detriment to the relationship uh, down the track. It doesn't always mean you're going to get what you want um, at the end of it. And um, I would always advocate for mediation. Now, mediation can take place in terms of a family relationship centre, which is funded by the Attorney General's Department. Great, it's funded, so it's cost effective. However, massive wait lists, huge backlog of um, clients wanting to come through for mediation. So, you know, that, that's one downfall. However, what we do have in Australia at the moment is a handful of trial elder mediation sites and I work in one of those and that is and there's only a handful of them but the elder mediation sits outside of the family law court system so it, it it's mediation it's a family meeting it's a softer option and potentially can be perceived as less threatening so it doesn't have a legal context around it so it's invitational so is the mediation in the family law system. However, what you get from the family law system mediation is that if mediation is unsuccessful, you can be given a certificate, which would then allow you to go through the court process that Sue was mentioning before to get parent parenting orders. In the elder mediation space, we take far more of a therapeutic approach and really wanting to look at the relationship and what has brought the family to this point where there is grandparent alienation. So we spend a lot of time in the preparation phase talking to the families. Um, we do invite, so we are guided by the older person, by the grandparent about who they want to invite into that process. And we will always be guided by them in that, in that area. But we bring the parties to the table. It's an opportunity for them to start the conversation about what went wrong. How did we actually get to this point? Now, the trick is, what happens if we, if the grandparents are unable to locate the, know where the children, are, the grandchildren are living or the parents of the grandchildren are living? So this elder mediation is fine. It works and it can work well when we have access to all of the parties that are required to be there at the family meeting to attempt to resolve the issues. And what um, are you finding? Can I just yeah. interrupt here? Sure. Uh, when people are invited, do you get a good response rate? Um, yeah. <laughs> so if, um, and it is often about what is the driver that has caused the alienation. So um, we, have a, we have a good success rate when we get them to the table. Now, mediation or family meetings in the elder abuse, uh, in the elder abuse space on, around um, grandparent alienation could take you know, six to 12 weeks. So there's a real um, preparation for the grandparents to really have an understanding of what it is they want to bring to the table. Um, there might be concurrent um, counselling happening at the same time. So the success will often depend on the willingness of parties to want to resolve, but it will also depend upon the type of alienation that is occurring. Now, I'm hearing about this great service in Queensland um, and some pilots in other places. I've got a question here. Is it available in Queen, in New South Wales? Look, I'm, I, because I don't, I haven't got the specific sites myself here at hand, but I would definitely encourage anybody to contact Relationships Australia and they'll be able to give them the um sites and the locations so there is a couple of states that missed out and I'm not quite sure which ones they were but we only have one in Queensland and it covers the Moreton Bay region so we're hoping that future funding will be put forward for these programs as well because they actually are a better not a better they're a value add to the family relationship centres 
but they're a softer option in terms of being able to nurture the, the grandparents and the family members through what's going on. Now, I've got a question for Sue that's come up in the chat box. Uh, do any of the panel advocates, and I think we've alluded to this, uh, advocate a grandparent using Section 65C of the Family Law Act to seek orders? Now, would you have to spend time with their grandchildren? Or does this really, is this really the final death knell to, to the family relationship? Section 65C looks at who can apply for um, parenting orders. And as I said before, and grandparents fit into that category. Um, perhaps I should change careers and get into mediation rather than the law. Um, because yes, you can do it. Um, but what, what's the price going to be? I mean, I appreciate there are all different circumstances and looking at some of the, the chats that have come in, I can certainly see what's happening out there. But um, the court will look at what's in the best interests of the child. Um, and that's that's the bottom line. And, and then I might interrupt you what here. You... I beg your pardon, Sue. No, no, go, go. Well... There's also questions of what is the legal age of the grandchild that you can make contact? There's a lot of questions about that. When can you legally make contact with the grandchild? Or what's the environment there? Well, pretty toxic, I would say. Um, the actual age, I have to be honest and say I'm not sure whether the courts... Um, look at each case individually, looking at the maturity of the child, looking at the circumstances surrounding it. Um, I'm not sure that it is a, a blanket age, you know, if we're looking at younger children. Um, so, look, it's heartbreaking. I, I, please don't think I'm hard-nosed about this. It is absolutely heartbreaking for grandparents who are denied access. Mm -hmm. No one will dispute that. But... I do feel that going to court would have to be in, in grandparent alienation, not grandparents raising grandchildren, but in grandparent alienation, mm. what are you hoping to achieve? And is it going to be the same as what the end result will really be? So we're very unclear at what age a, a grandparent can make uh, yep. contact. Yeah, that's very unclear because a lot of people are concerned about that because what I'm picking up on the Q&A here um, of the chat box is that people really want to show their grandchildren that they've fought for that contact, that they've they've turned every stone. And um, Adonis Antonius, could I bring you in here? Uh, what are you advising through your support groups uh, for grandparents to do? Yes, yeah, so in, in the context where I work in Melbourne, um, to look at look at the landscape, we've got more than two hundred uh, ethnicities in our state. We have more than one hundred thirty five religions, and we have forty six percent of our population having at least one member of the family born overseas. And out of that, seventy six point eight percent in a non English speaking country. So why I'm saying this is because there is a mosaic of uh, cultures, languages, belief systems, etc., which does impact on um, behaviors, decision-making processes. Uh, there's additional barriers in terms of language, in terms of um, many grandparents who do not have a common point of reference when it comes to services and supports. For example, they may not uh, be aware of mediation or they may not know what mediation stands for. Uh, perhaps they didn't have mediation in their country of origin and at the time of their migration. So there's a lot of, a lot of new concepts and I think a lot of grandparents that we've seen through, through our work, there's a lot of underlying issues that, that impact them uh, and hinder them in, in, in actually um, commencing a process you know, for resolution. Um, for example, gender roles, um, reasons of migration, the time of migration, expectations, um, you know, the role that, that the adult son place in certain communities and families versus the adult daughter 
uh, who, who looks after the children. Um, these are things I think that go across communities, but from my work specifically with non-English speaking uh, grandparents, um, since 2007, the best, most successful, uh, best practice model that we have used is uh, collaborating with mediation centers and running courses in language um, and do it jointly with the mediation centers. So we have actually um, sensitized communities about what is mediation that it is actually something that they can pursue because a lot of people have gone straight to the courts. Uh, and as uh, Gabriel said previously, you know, even if the other party doesn't want to come to the table and, and, and discuss, they can get a certificate that says they've tried everything they can. The other party is not willing. They can go to court with that and then, you know, they see things can, can continue from there. But I have seen a lot of resolution, uh, Philippa, through mediation. I have seen a lot of grandparents that didn't have access to the children. They, they, they had gifts returned. They haven't been, um, you know, participating in, in, in anything meaningful in their lives and sometimes for a decade or more. And I think uh, the mediation process, it's definitely one of the things that I know it has worked. That's that's really wonderful news. And you even have a, a radio program where you're getting the word out, don't you? And and this is something that uh, uh, Compass is is trying to do. And all of you as panelists and through the chat box here, we're hearing from Relationships Australia that they have elder mediation in pretty much every state in Australia. So take a look. There are links and there will be more on the Compass websites to help you navigate a way towards mediation mediation. And uh, um, Sue, uh, you've mentioned some other great uh, resources to turn to. And I think you are also, you know, when we're making that correlation of grandparent alienation and financial abuse, um, and some other services and go to people that you think are really top shelf. Okay. Um the, the two that I, I really sort of um, endorse, if you like, and speak highly of are uh, what's called the FIS offices at Centrelink, the Financial Information Services offices. Um, at one stage, there were about 200 for Australia. I'm not sure how many there are now. Um, and the FIS officers will not give you advice, financial advice, but they will give you information. This is what, you know, if, if you're raising a grandchild or um, whatever the situation is, and uh, but they're not just for grandparents by any means, it's anyone. Um, this is this is what's available. And the, the wonderful thing about the FIS officer is you do not have to be a Centrelink or Services Australia um, recipient in any shape or form. Anyone can go to make an appointment and speak to a FIS officer. It is the most um, under-advertised, I suppose, um, you know, uh, facility or resource um, amongst um, the government departments. The other one, of course, is the grandparent advisors. And I think last count, there were about six of them for Australia. Um, and they mainly look at grandparents raising children or about to uh, raise uh, grandchildren. Uh, however, um, I still think it would be worthwhile um, contacting the grandparent advisors at, Cent I keep saying Centrelink Services Australia, um, and find out what they can actually offer. But most people, and I, I'm not denigrating most people uh, by any means, they just don't know about the FIS officer and the grandparent advisor. So now we've got 193 participants, it seems, that do. <laughs> Look, thank you very much. And there are some really heartbreaking uh, accounts being given on the chat mm. room. So I do really uh, direct you to uh, the Elder Helpline. Um, and I'll give you that number again uh, in a moment. Uh, but it is 1-800-353-374, 1-800-353-374. Uh, we've got, uh, well, someone I know, and everyone knows someone when we start talking about this, 
who uh, is still waiting on an outcome from the family court uh, after uh, hearings five years ago. They're still sort of caught in that, that legal cycle and they haven't seen their beautiful grandchildren uh, for, you know, almost a decade. Um, and, you know, it is hard to see what other avenues you can go for. Other people are saying that they've been to mediation, but is it enforceable? Um, and do you necessarily go the next step? Um, may I have your comments there, please? Yeah. Is it okay if I just make a comment? Please. So um, that is correct. If you reach a agreement at mediation, then it's not legally binding. However, you can take the agreement from the mediation, seek legal advice, and then have it registered as a consent order. Does right. that make sense? Yes. Yep. So in the first instance, you can walk away from mediation uh, with an agreement, a parenting agreement, but that's not legally binding unless it's actually registered with the courts. Now we've got can, two. Yes. Sorry, there's just one thing I wanted to mention there. And I know that we're seeing a lot of comments come through from people who are right in the crux and the thick of grandparent alienation. But if I could just sort of, if someone is, uh, is thinking that their children, adult children are... Um, separating or divorcing or um, wanting to and then they're going to mediation to get a parenting agreement that they speak with their son or daughter and say when you when you get this um, parenting agreement can you make sure that you include provision in the parenting agreement for the grandparents for myself and your father or whoever to have contact um, at how will the children maintain the grandchildren maintain a meaningful relationship and have that put in the parenting agreement as well. Okay, I got to ask you and Sue and Adonis Antonius, how specific are you and how do you do it and what stage? Sue, do you want or? No, I'll Gabrielle. let you do it because you okay. <laughs> yeah. okay, so there was a double double barrel question. Oh, sorry, I'm guessing. Yes. Okay. So when do you do it? Yes. Um, how do point, you do it? Yeah. And how at, specific point, are you? Triple okay. barrel. Yeah. Okay. So at point of separation, um, we, you know, and this is the ideal world. Wouldn't it be lovely if there is this uh, amicable this agreement that, okay, we'll go to mediation and we will actually form a parenting agreement that is in the best interest of the children and the grandchildren, um, you can, a, a good mediation service will provide you with an initial assessment stage. So each party will have an assessment appointment. After that, they'll be provided with information from the practitioner, so the family dispute resolution practitioner, about what it is that they need to think about in preparing so there's a guide, a guide, if you like, or a booklet or some information given to them about thinking about the things that they need to include in a parenting agreement. Where will the children go to school? How will they spend Christmas? How will they have birthdays? How will they spend time with grandparents? Um, what religion will they follow? So all of those details can come from a family relationship um, centre um, practitioner. And then when you're ready to come back into the mediation, you've got that preparation there. So you've got some notes and some ideas drafted out. Please don't enter into a mediation just thinking we'll just deal with it on the day. It's really good to prepare yourself and to really look at the impact on children who are alienated from parents and grandparents. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to go there, but we're really encouraging where possible and when possible to be very activists uh, yeah. uh, that to really advocate for yourself and your relationship with yes. your grandchild and you know the big question is what's at stake here and it's the grandchildren yeah. um, and of course your relationship with the grandchildren and Gabrielle you've alluded to some research around the impact on grandchildren yeah, anecdotally of a sudden severing of, of that very special relationship. Yeah, and I mean, we know that there is research that will support and say that um, children can develop, and this is particularly where the children have had a really um, strong relationship or a meaningful relationship with grandparents and it's suddenly severed. 
in that instance, they actually can develop anxiety disorders, depression, can have an impact on their ability to understand how relation how relationships form and are maintained in families. And they can also feel that they have to take sides. So it's if mum and dad are denigrating grandparents, it, the children are, well, I live with mum and dad. Is, am I believing what they need, what they're saying? It wasn't always like this. So there's quite a lot of confusion for them. Um, we do need to take care of those little minds and we need to make sure that um, where possible, if we can get them into counselling, then that's great. But mm-hmm. there is definitely an impact in terms of developing separation anxiety, all of those things that come with. And you've got to also consider at what age is this happening for the child? Is it, you know, toddlers? Is it um, primary age, primary school age? Is it adolescence? Mm-hmm. And adolescents often get torn between families, unfortunately. Adonis Antonius, would you like to come in here? Yes, really, but uh, going back to the steps that we can take, and I can see there's a lot of questions about mediation and also uh, what other options uh, are. Um, The way we've been working here in Melbourne is um, providing information, um, uh, particularly for people who don't speak English, utilizing ethnic media, utilizing, you know, community organizations, visiting in senior citizens clubs and and talking about this issue. Um, And collaborations are pivotal in this because um, we have um, done a lot of collaborations with um, the Ethnic Community Councils of Victoria, Seniors' Rights Victoria, uh, the police, like the the, the local government, etc. But the way I see it is this information provision so people are aware. And then when people call, there's the advocacy when we have to you know, take them by the hand, if I can say that, um, and help them. And then there's the referral. And I think the way that I've seen this work developing these years is, um, apart from the information provision, there is also consultation. And there is um, this peer support groups where grandparents can chit-chat, connect, uh, and, and break that isolation and alienation they feel, talk with others who have similar lived experiences. Uh, this can happen online. This can happen face-to-face. This can happen over the phone. Um, of course, there's counselling, as, as we mentioned. Mm-hmm. You know, So I'm thinking there's so many steps uh, before you even think of mediation, you know, yes. there's so many steps and supports that are pivotal to start that process um, be- before the mediation. And I find that often um, many people may not know these steps or how to navigate the system and access these. So they may go straight to the court or they may mm-hmm. go to mediation. But there's so many things that we can do to actually prepare us. And, and when when we do go to mediation or to court, then we are ready and we know we've done everything we could. Um, and, you know, it, it is it is a step by step and it is very complex. So um, I'd like to encourage people to utilize this, you know, to make the phone calls, call the helplines, um, pick up counseling if that's something that will help, uh, join a support group in their area, chit chat with others, and, and all that um, helps a lot. And particularly people who come from non-English speaking communities, it can be so much harder because you've got also the language issue, you've got the issue of unable to access technology or not, not having internet, um, unable to download something to read even in their own language. So sometimes we need to take a few steps back to actually sort of initiate people into that, you know, facilitate that process. Sue, have you got something to say there? Because uh, with your assessment of going to court being really the last resort, would you encourage people to avail themselves of all of this beforehand? Absolutely. Everything that you can avail yourself of before going to court, and and as Adonna says, before mediation even. Mm. But the point is, how do we get to these people? I mean, and people who have English as a second language, but lots of people who have English as their first language. Mm -hmm. They don't know the process. I mean, and particularly if we're looking at grandparents who are baby boomers, Mm -hmm. we mainly grew up or the majority of us grew up in um, parents who stayed married, whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. And 
the we grew up with the Brady Bunch on TV. As someone once said, they only had to be a happy family for half an hour a week. Um, <laughs> but did but, we see the grandparents in the Brady Bunch? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't think we did. Uh, but we certainly see the grandmother in young Sheldon and yes. she might be the type of grandmother that some parents wouldn't want their, their kids to mix with. But um, I, I think the point is um, to get the message out there that, yes, it is absolutely devastating when this happens, grandparent alienation. And you hear stories of grandparents who stand on the footpath outside the school. Now, I want to take things. you up on that. Are you allowed to do that? On the footpath? Certainly not in the school grounds. Mm -hmm. um, but then you could be asked to move on understandably in these days of course you know with uh, child protection and that um, they might go somewhere where they hope that they'll have a glimpse of the grandchild um, and they thought that yes yes that's true so um, and so, then you know, no, I just on. like all your thoughts on um, if you know what school your child goes to whether that's a good I, idea. I think no, um, certainly not uh, approaching the school because the school will want to be at arm's distance um, and I can understand that. Um, I, I don't believe in subversive activities. However, um, I think people, the grandparents, need to be informed of what options there are. And I know that there's the purpose of this, but this, I dare say, looking at the number of questions and the chats, um, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that there are actually uh, resources out there, and I think in the first instance, making sure that people are aware of that, doing all their, their own research, if you like, you know, find out what support groups. I noticed someone said they have a support group uh, for grandparents experiencing this. And of course, no one's raised the word shame um, today that I've seen. And sometimes grandparents uh, feel shamed about this, that, well, what have I done? What have I done? Did I bring up my child the wrong way that this has happened? You know, and look, I'm just am I fault because my hmm. and I'm just wondering with the kids, the grandkids. We've got um, a time lag on this. Sorry about that. I'm just wondering with the grandkids, and Colleen Hanlon has has raised it. Sometimes the grandkids blame themselves. What have I done that we're not seeing, you know, grandma and grandpa anymore? Um, and I'm just I want to bring it forward uh, to a, a bit of a positive note um you see your grandkids for the first time it might be a decade but you're finally reunited what do you say to your grandchild well you don't denigrate their parents no. because then you're back to square one that's it <laughs> totally um, just i think you just take it from there into the future this is so exciting yeah. And not putting pressure on the kid either or the grandchildren. Mm. Agreed. Yes, that's it. Mm. Colleen's comment that you love and always will love them. Mm. And there's no blame there. There's no recrimination. No. It's making the child feel safe and secure. Absolutely. And look, you know, we're picking up here. A lot of people have gone through uh, the courts and they're still no closer after a decade are there any other avenues? Um, but in the meantime, what do you do? Just picking up on Colleen's suggestions of that treasure box, that story of the grandparents' love for their grandchildren, um, the returned birthday cards. If I could hear from the three of you, uh, one by one, maybe you first, Adonis Antonius, uh, of just what you do. I actually have um, missed your question here. I'm a little bit confused. <laughs> what do you do 
to prepare for that day where you will eventually see your grandchild. It okay. might be that they've left home for the first time and they think, well, now's the time to get in touch with um, Nan or Nonna, you know, or, or Grandpa. Mm -hmm. Look, as I said earlier, I believe uh, there's a combination of things to support the grandparents to get to that point. So these are things that grandparents can discuss in, in support groups, in peer support groups. These are things they can discuss with a counselor to actually prepare for that. Each individual case is different. Um, I don't think there's one size fits all. Um, I've seen some of the comments in the chat and there's some really good comments about, you know, you love the grandchildren and you will always love them, be impartial, don't take sides, you know, but it is very difficult, uh, as you said, after 10 years, that's a very long time to, mm. to, to, especially in the, in the, in the time of a child's life. I mean, after 10 years, there may be an adult, so, <laughs> you know, um, but I think uh, this is, this is, again, step-by-step step, a work that grandparents can do. Uh, it takes time. They need to share the stories with others um, and, and sort of build that uh, rapport, reduce the feelings of isolation that they may feel, the loneliness, the self-esteem and self-confidence is one of the things that really is impacted. So they will need to regain that in, in the way that they understand and make sense to them. Um, and it all starts with prevention. It all starts with raising awareness, with having these discussions like we do today um, and, and provide the information that, that they require. And then I think it's a matter of um, it's individual, you know, taking up each case with mm. the service they engage. So a good, a good start would be, for example, calling seniors' rights um, uh, helpline and chatting about this, talking to the Office of Public Advocate, planning for the future, where do they want to be in five years, how do they want this to go, and, and finding out about uh, supports that are available for them. I just want to say, Philippa, here that we need to keep in mind, because a lot of people may not realize that Grandparent alienation is a form of elder abuse, abuse. And, and elder abuse is part of family violence. So this is actually a family violence issue mm -hmm. uh, and it is a serious issue. And, and, and legally, that's why people need to know what the options are, what the supports are, because uh, this is not just something that, oh, well, you know, it's, it, it is actually part of family violence. I think mm -hmm. that's what I want to stress out because a lot of people... Um, may not not know that you know equally with neglect that a lot of people don't think that neglect is um, and it can be intentional it can be unintentional but it's still part of family violence so i think we need to treat it um you know in seriousness because this is really part of the family violence uh, framework mm -hmm. we work under the maram framework so the approach is the same for the grandparents who experience this as for parents and anyone else in a family violence situation. And look, we've only got like one minute left, but I would just ask Gabriel and um, Sue to make their final comments. Thank you. Look, I agree with everything that um, the panel, my colleagues have said in terms of what you can do in preparation for the day when you will have that um, grandchild come to you as an adult perhaps um, or a, a late teen. But one of the things I wanted to say was to look after yourself. In that meantime, look after yourself and look after your relationship with your partner. This has a dramatic impact for grandparents on their relationship, their intimate relationship, and that they need to foster that and look after that because the alienation can become all-consuming and they really need to take time out to think about themselves, seek some relationship counselling, seek that peer support that my colleagues have been talking about and make sure that you look after yourselves because if you run yourselves into the ground, you're not going to be any good for your grandchildren when they do come to you at the end um, of this dilemma, if you like. I don't want to minimise what people's experiences have been either and that they've shared today. They are heart-wrenching. 
and it is a matter of elder abuse and it is one that needs to be spoken about a lot more. We need more support for these people and we need to ensure that we recognise it, name it as psychological abuse under the banner of elder abuse. Over Thanks. to you, Sue. Well, I couldn't agree more with both um, Adonis and Gabrielle um, and, and what some of the chat people are saying. Don't give up. Uh, ensure that you do look after yourself. Um, try not to alienate your own child as well. And don't put the guilt on to anyone, including the child. Um, yeah. And don't feel that you need to be ashamed of anything yourself because you might worry that people will say, well, what kind of a mother was she um, mm -hmm. if, you know, her own child won't let, let her see, you know, the grandchild, the grandchildren, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. So don't be ashamed of, of discussing it. It's yep. as simple as that. And so often with elder abuse, and yes, I agree it's elder abuse, um, we don't talk about it because it happens to other people. It doesn't happen to us. Yeah. And also some people, so bridge or bingo again, um, would just be mortified because it would be a conversation stopper. Mm. And so therefore we don't talk to anyone about it. And knowing that, as Colleen has told us, the grandparent alienation support groups, um, I think it's essential um, that we look to those. Now, look, thank you to our wonderful panellists and thank you very much as well to Grandparents for Grandchildren, the wonderful um, words that we had from Colleen Hanlon. Now, remember, there is the Elder Helpline, 1800 Elder Help. That's 1800 353 374. Now, a recording of this webinar will be available on the Compass website this afternoon, later this afternoon. Compass has a program of upcoming free webinars on topics including the importance of family agreements, arranging powers of attorney, attorney combating isolation, and addressing ageism. You can subscribe to the Compass e-newsletter at www.compass.info to keep in touch with what's coming up. Thank you and goodbye.